All right, this tooth, tooth number 19, was prepped, impression was made, case was sent to the lab. This is not a good prep, guys. This is not a good impression. Uh, my job tonight is to kind of have you think about Crown and Bridge in a different way and to prevent you from sending cases like this to your lab. I don't know if Lisa mentioned this, but I am one of the speakers of Catapult Education, and I'm also on the editorial board for Dental Products Report. Um, I, I really enjoy being in, this, in these two groups. Um, they allow me to see a lot of different products, a lot of different equipment. Um, I'm evaluating different products and equipment every month. And it just gives me the opportunity to kind of see things differently than just practicing every day. I am a general dentist. I practice every day. Um, and over time that gets tiring, but um, being in these organizations frees me up to do a lot of different things like put on this webinar tonight. So what am I gonna talk about tonight? I'm gonna walk you through from start to finish, prepping, soft tissue management, and impressions, both digital and traditional impressions. We also, what's really unique about this course is that I'm gonna be talking about prepping and impressions from the lab's point of view, in terms of what they want from us in order for them to deliver good Crown and Bridge cases. Now, we're gonna be here for two hours. And out of those two hours, there are five things that no matter what, this is what I'm trying to get across to you guys. Um, at the end of this presentation, if you have any questions and we haven't answered them, you're more than welcome to email me and I'll send you this whole presentation in a PDF format. So, but for now, these five things, very important. You wanna write these down. I'm gonna take my time. We're gonna go through them and um, hope you guys get a lot of this presentation. So the first things that I want you to know in order to improve your Crown and Bridge cases is loops, gotta have them. Second thing, no impression made unless you see all portions of the margins. Third, bite registration. We wanna make sure that you're doing a separate bite registration with the patient in the full upright position. Fourth, looking at every impression before it leaves the office. And fifth, applying light body material to the opposing arch when you're taking a final pressure in traditional impression material. Now let's break these down. Loops. Study have shown that loops definitely allow you to see better than direct vision. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you other than if you're not wearing loops, you just can't see the things that you're doing. You can't see your preps margins very well. Um, even doing general dentistry in terms of doing fillings um, and resins, um, I use my loops all the time. And not only are you, do they allow you to see a little bit better, but they also relieve you from having a lot of stress on your back, your neck, and your eyes. So make sure that you get loops. Now, out of those five things, this is the one that's going to cost a little bit of money, but it's worth it in the long run. Number two no impressions made without seeing all the margins. So in this little picture on the, on the left-hand side here, I try to prep like this, where I can see all of my margins all the way around, no excuses. In the middle, you'll see a clinical photo of one of my preps. Again, I like nice thick width preps um, so I can see everything because you know what, if I can see it, I want my dental assistant to see it, Hell, I want my patient to be able to say, like, here, here's the mirror. You take a look. They're like, oh, yeah, Ms. Jones, I, I want you to see this prep. I want you to see these margins. It's like, oh, yeah, doctor, I can see that. So, again, just making it so, so obvious so that everybody can see your prep, your prep margins. The third thing, bite registration. You want to make sure that the patient is as upright as possible. And if you're just using traditional bite registration material, you're just having the patient just bite down in that material and capture the most natural and even occlusion that you can with this bite. With this bite. Um, and when you're doing it digitally, as you can see in this lower right picture, it's even easier. 
a lot of times some doctors like to the left, like to use a triple tray and that bite registration. That's not a very good bite registration to use when you're trying to fabricate a permanent restoration. So try not to use the triple tray bite registration. Try to get an individual separate bite registration. Number four, looking at every impression before you send it out. It's so important. I know we have busy schedules. You know, we see in our patients, we're doing hygiene checks, but you have to take the time to look at your impressions before they go out. And this is an example of um, a case that I got from a lab. I mean, this impression is just not great. It's not great, but I understand people get busy. You know, you wanna move on to the next patient, but you have to take the time to look at your impressions, whether they're, you know, if you're taking more than a couple of minutes to look at an impression, you probably need to retake that impression. In this case, this is um, tooth number six. They prepped this tooth for a veneer. This is the model that's been poured up to the right. Uh, that's just not a good impression. How can a lab work with this? How can they make a, a veneer from this model? It's almost impossible, but yet labs get these kind of cases all the time. And then the last one, applying light body to the opposing arcs when you're taking the final impression. You know, Crown and Bridge just isn't about putting light body around your margins and on the contact areas of the adjacent teeth and the occlusal surfaces, you need more than that. And so when you're applying light body to the opposing arch, you're getting a more defined impression of that arch, which allows the lab to make a better restoration so that there's less adjustment time at the seat visit. So in this case, I've taken an impression of tooth number three. This is the final impression. Here is tooth number 30, the opposing arc with the light body impression over the occlusal surfaces. With this, I got a nice detailed opposing arch to allow the lab to make a good restoration with a limited amount of time in terms of the adjustments at the seat visit. All right, so let's make sure that we all kind of start off in, in the same page when it comes to um, margins and preps. As you can see here to the left, um, I have an anterior tooth. This is my axial wall with these blue dots. This is my internal portion of my margin on this yellow, the orange dot. And here is the external portion of my margin with this yellow dot with my finish line. Same thing with the posterior teeth. We got axial wall, internal margin, external margin. The live clinical photo of tooth number eight, axial wall and the blue dots, internal line angle with the orange, and my finish line or external margin with these yellow dots. Now, I'm gonna run through really quickly, just basic prepping and, and just impressions. This is tooth number 19. I did this case just two days ago. Um, tooth was root canal. Um, Final impression was digitally scanned. Um, first thing I did, occlusal reduction with a, with a coarse diamond football burr. Uh, these photos were done by my dental assistants. They did a wonderful job with these photos. Um, my next was my gross reduction with a, a rounded ended coarse tapered burr. I tend to use anywhere between five to six types of burrs when I'm doing a case. To the left is me refining my preps at the margins with a needle shape burr. And then also smoothing out my margin with a round, with a end cutting burr. As you can see, again, I like to have nice wide, thick margins. So I can very easily see these margins. Then my soft tissue management, I'm gonna do some retraction with Retraction paste, and in this case, I'm using a retraction cap. I place the paste around my prep, having the patient bite down this retraction cap for about two to three minutes. Wash it off, wash off the retraction paste, and then take my impression. In this case, we've done a, a digital scan of tooth number 19. As you can see, nice wide margins. No mistaking where my finish lines are, no mistaking um, that I've able to push the soft tissue 
off my margin so I can see everything. And that's what I strive for, no matter what type of prep I'm doing, whether it's anterior, whether it's posterior, this is what I want to see. Typically, once I've prepped my tooth, taken the impression, um, we start fabricating the temporary crown. Before I temporarily cement my temporary crown, I like to make sure that we clean off our preps. Anytime that I'm cutting into dentin, I like to clean that tooth off with some type of solution. In this case, I'm using Chemoseal by Advantage Dental Products. Uh, this product has antimicrobial properties with chlorhexidine, making sure that there's no bacteria growing underneath my temporaries or permanent restorations. It also can de desensitize and in cases where I want to bond my final restoration to the prep, it also enhances the bond strength of my bonding agent. So this is a good product that I use, not only when I'm prepping, but also when I'm doing just regular fillings. I wanna make sure that I've kind of cleaned up my prep, um, desensitized and, and blocked all those tubules, so dental tubules, so that I have less post-op sensitivity. So, what do labs really want to know as far as um, what we're sending them, the cases that we're sending them? Um, right now, I think I'm up to about 15 different labs that I've talked to and asked them questions in terms of, you know, how can us dentists do better jobs in, in terms of crown and bridge? So one of the questions that I asked all the labs is that, if there are things that you would want to tell dentists that they need to change or improve upon um, as they're prepping and taking impressions, what would those things be? And all the way across the board, they come up with the same answers. Um, and I'm going to share those answers with you. And they're not in any particular order. But the first one is selecting the right margin type for the case. Another one is no undercuts in your prep. The third one, prepping the occlusal one third of your preps or of your teeth. Having smooth axial walls. And then the last, well-defined gingival margins. These are the things that the lab is asking us as dentists to provide them so they can produce quality crown and bridge. So let's go over margin types. At the top, you can see feather edge, knife edge. These are the most common margin types that we've learned in dental school. Beveled edge, shoulders, chamfered. Particularly, I like to do chamfered because it kind of covers the gambit of what type of cases that I'm going to be sending in in terms of crown and bridge. So as you see at the bottom, zirconia, Emax, PFMs. If you're going to be sending cases that are these, your margin type should be chamfered or shoulders. If you're gonna be doing PFMs or full metal crown, your margin type should be knife edge, bevel margins. Again, this is very important for the lab because if your margin type matches your case, they can do a better job in making the crowns. Another big sticking point with the lab is undercuts, no undercuts in the design of your preps. That's what we all should strive for because undercuts are very, very hard to deal with from the lab's point of view. Now, when the labs are telling me undercuts, I just wanna make sure that we all understand there's differences in terms of what types of undercuts that can happen while we're prepping. Now, this first one is an undercut within the middle of my axial wall. Now, sometimes this is created by decay when we're removing it. Sometimes it's created by um, a void in the buildup when we're building up a tooth. Um, this type of undercut can be easily fixed and worked around from the lab's point of view in regards of just filling it in or using the, the software that, that we've used to scan this, these preps, using the software to kind of block out this area. Um, so this type of undercutting isn't that bad. The labs can kind of deal with it. This undercut, however, further down the axial wall where you have 
more of the axial wall at the gingival level, more internal as opposed to the axial wall at the top, which is a little bit further out. Again, this undercut is very, very difficult to work with in terms of the lab, and you don't want to prep your teeth like this. The last one in which the lab really um, has a hard time fabricating crowns upon is when you have undercuts created by lack of reduction or no reduction of your axial wall. And again, these are the types of cases, and I've circled this in red, these are the type of cases that the lab gets all the time. And they're very difficult and challenge. It's not even a challenge because you can't make a crown when you have undercuts this severe in your prep, where you're barely prepping the axial wall. It's got nice margins down here, but it, it's not gonna work from the lab's point of view. So making sure that when we're doing our preps that we don't have any undercuts. Prepping the occlusal surface or the occlusal one third of the tooth. Um, when we're prepping, it should be in three planes, in the anterior at the gingival one third, middle one third, and then the incisal one third. In the posterior, same thing, gingival one third, middle one third, occlusal one third. Making sure that this occlusal or incisal one third of your prep gets prepped. What this does is allows enough room for a thicker restoration that's gonna be long lasting and more durable and more likely not to fracture over time. Again, you wanna make sure that you're prepping this occlusal one third of your tooth um, before you take your impressions. Smooth axial walls. After you do your gross reduction with the coarse diamond burr, you wanna make sure that you refine your preps by using that same size burr and a fine diamond. What this does is creates nice smooth surfaces um, so that your final, your final restoration can evenly distribute the occlusal forces um, over the entire restoration and allowing it not to fracture or break over time. Also having these smooth surfaces, it increases the crown's ability to kind of fit onto the tooth more snugly. As you can see to the left or to the right, um, this is after gross reduction. We get to this point with our coarse diamond burrs, but the next step would be to take a fine diamond burr and to smooth all these surfaces out. Not only the axial wall, but also the occlusal surface too. The last thing we wanna do is have well-defined gingival margins. I typically do this with a needle or flame-shaped fine diamond burr going around my whole margins to make sure that A, I can see my margins, confirming that they're there. Um, B, when you do define your margins, you're creating a little bit of space for your next step, which is gonna be your soft tissue management. Um, you wanna make sure that as you define your prep, you're not prepping the side of the tooth. You're only going down maybe a millimeter at most. And you're just trying to make sure that all that surfaces, those surfaces are nice and smooth and even so that when you do take your impression, the impression material flows, not just at the margins, but beyond and over the edge. Same thing with the scanners. A lot of people are scanning now. So with the digital scanners, when you have unsmooth surfaces, surfaces that are choppy, um, it takes longer for the scanner to, to capture these, these portions of the margin. So if they're nice and smooth, the scan can capture them very quickly and accurately. So now we're gonna go through the burrs. What burrs I'm using, what burrs you should be using. Um, I'm gonna go over the burr types, shapes and sizes, and also I'm gonna go through the cutting sequences, how we, when and when not to use the burrs that we are using. Burr selection, as I mentioned before, I like using anywhere between five to seven burrs per case. I usually use diamond burrs and they're either coarse and fine grit. Depending on the case, I may use single use burrs or multi-use burrs. Typically with 
the multi-use burrs, I like to I like to use those in single tooth prepping. Um, I feel like um, I can get a lot of those burrs in prepping anywhere between five to six diff different cases or five to six teeth with the multi-use burrs. The other type of burrs, the single-use burrs, I tend to like to use with multiple prepping when I'm doing big cases, four and five preps or um, multiple bridges. Um, in this case, we're using a new burr, cuts really fast. I can be really efficient in terms of getting through my, my cutting sequences as opposed to using a multi-use burr that may be dull. Um, in these cases, I like to use the single use burrs and I feel like I get my money's worth out of them because I'm not just using them on one tooth and then throwing them away. I'm using them on multiple teeth and um, it makes the cutting a lot more easier. So the burrs, because I like the chamfer types of margins, I, I particularly stick to the rounded and tapered burrs using their coarse, in this case, I'll use a medium sized burr to kind of break through my contacts initially. And I'll also use these burrs to do the gross reduction on smaller teeth, usually anteriors or premolars. Now I'll use a large round in the tapered burr when I'm doing reduction, gross reduction on molars. And then as I mentioned before, I use those same types of burrs, but in a fine grit to do my refinement of the preps. The diamond egg-shaped burr, I use that as we saw before to do my occlusal reduction and incisal reductions. The needle or flame-shaped burr, is fine grit. Again, I use that to define my gingival margins. And this last burr, this gold finishing egg-shaped burr, I'll use that to smooth off um, the occlusal surface or the incisal surface of my preps. Now, these other burrs, the depth cutting burrs, um, they're good, especially when there's multiple teeth that you're trying to prep. Um, it makes the cutting be more efficient, more even. You're not trying to eyeball each tooth. Um, with the depth cutting burr, you're getting the same depth on each tooth in terms of how you're prepping. Um, I don't use these that often, uh, but when I'm prepping multiple teeth, they're, they're good to use. But this other burr, the end cutting burr, I use that pretty frequently. Um, it allows you, as it says, to cut at the end of this burr. There's diamonds that allow you to make sure that your margins are nice and smooth and even. Um, because I use a chamfered burr, I don't always get a nice smooth um, margin surface. And sometimes on the edges of my preps, I'm going to have to kind of even them out because I could get kind of a, a J type of prep. And in order for me to kind of correct that, I'll take this end cutting burr, smooth this off, and, and I'm good to go as far as my margins are concerned. Now getting through the cutting sequence. First thing I wanna do is break through the contacts and I'm using a coarse medium sized burr for that. And the next thing I'm gonna be doing is reducing my occlusion, occlusion with one of the football diamond, the egg-shaped diamond burrs, of course. The third thing I'm gonna do is do my axial wall reduction, followed with defining the gingival margin, and then refining my prep at the end. And we're gonna go through these step by step. Breaking through the contact. I do this with a medium thickness rounded in taper coarse burr. Um, as I'm breaking through the contact, I want to get a sense of how numb this tooth is. If it's numb, I just kind of keep going and breaking through the contact. Uh, also, it gives me a sense of how hard the enamel is or how tough this is going to be cutting through. Do I need another burr that's a little bit um, sharper and more newer? Um, I'll get that sense while I'm breaking through the contacts. Also, as I get through these contacts, I'm able to see on the adjacent teeth, um, if there's any actual wall decay or, or interproximal decay on these teeth. And if there is, I can go ahead and restore them. If not, keep breaking through the contacts. 
starting with this part of the prep sequence, um, it, it frees up space between the adjacent teeth so that I can do the next step, which is my occlusal reduction. Occlusal reduction. I use this egg-shaped diamond burr. It's usually coarse. Um, occlusal reduction is, is an issue with the labs. As we go through this, you'll see this kind of this red label message from a lab. This is just indicating that things that the lab really stress that we as dentists should do as far as the problems that they find that are coming up a lot um, when cases are coming in. So I wanna make sure that with this reduction, we're re reducing at least two millimeters of, a, of clearance that are created with our preps. I typically just eyeball that two millimeters. If you're having a problem and you're, you're frequently getting cases to, coming back to you that the occlusion needs to be adjusted or um, for more space, you want to you can use these what, what are called flex tabs. They come in different widths, usually a millimeter, millimeter and a half, two millimeters, three millimeters. And what you do is once you've done your occlusal reduction, you stick these kind of rubber silicone tabs in between the, your prep and the opposing teeth. If it doesn't get caught up, that means you have enough reduction. And so the thing with the lab is, and when, you, when we're talking about occlusal reduction, you wanna make sure that you communicate with your lab. Usually when there's a, a case that there's a lack of space and you know that there's a lack of space, it's not like, you know, um, we don't know when, we, when there aren't that, when there's not that much space, you wanna make sure the lab knows that and not only knows that, knows how you want them to handle that space or lack of. Um, either with a reduction coping here, picture to the right, or reducing the opposing tooth, or if they want you to do more reduction and, and make a new impression. Whatever the situation is, I particularly like to ask for a reduction coping. Um, if I know that I'm going to be limited on the amount of space, um, I let the lab know on my, on my lab slip that, hey, if you don't have enough space, do me Give me a lab, um, give me a, a reduction coping so I can reduce this to the proper amount so my, my final restoration will fit. So here is a video showing me breaking through my contacts and reducing the occlusal surfaces. I usually start, in this case, it's tooth number three. I want to start on the mesial because it's easier for me to see. I'm right there. Um, I'm using this round-ended, coarse, medium-sized tapered burr to kind of get through that contact. Once I've gotten through that contact, I'm going to go to the distal, break through my contacts. As I'm doing this, I'm checking to see, making sure that there's no interproximal decay on the adjacent teeth. Once I've gotten through my contacts, The next step is going to be, I'm going to do my occlusal reduction. This is the egg-shaped coarse diamond burr. I'm starting on the buckle because, again, it's easier for me to see. I may have the patient bite down so I can check to see if I have enough clearance. Doing the buckle, flipping the burr, going to the lingual. Doing the same thing. Who's a reduction? Again, this is kind of really quick and easy and just buckle, lingle, moving on to the next, which is going to be my axial wall reductions. And because I've broken my contacts, it's allowed enough space for me to do this without touching adjacent teeth. Next is my axial wall reduction. With this, I'm gonna use a large rounded end tapered burr, usually coarse, to do my reduction. 
I start on the facial first, because again, it's nice and easy. I can see it. Um, I want to make sure that these margins are either at or slightly below the soft, the soft tissue. Once I do the facial, I'll do the lingual. With that, I want my margins to be slightly above the soft tissue, usually about one to two millimeters above. And then third, I'll do the interproximal. Interproximal is more or less the continuation of breaking the context that we started earlier. With those margins, I like those to be either at or slightly above the soft tissue. Again, to make it a little bit easier in terms of taking the impression. I see we have some questions. I'm gonna go through this and then answer the questions. And then the last thing we wanna do is define a gingival margin. I'm using this needle shaped burr. It's usually fine grit. I'm just kind of going around my margins. Again, verifying that the margins are there. I'm not really prepping. It's just a slow drag of the burr around the margins so that everything is nice and smooth and even to allow the impression material or scan to, to kind of go smoothly over these areas. Um, and as I mentioned before, as I do that, I'm also creating some space for my next step, which is gonna be soft tissue retraction. As you can see in this picture to the left, my margin after I'm done my prep, it's not even, it's kind of bumpy, it's not smooth. I'll take this fine diamond burr and just kind of go over around the edges and kind of smooth this out all the way around this prep. Again, as you can see, I can see the entire prep and that's what I want for every case. I can't stress that enough. The fact that the labs get cases after cases that they can't see the margins. And if you can't see the margins, the lab definitely can't see the margins. So this is a demonstration of, of using that burr and to kind of redefine that gingival margin. This is part of a three unit bridge. This is tooth number seven, um, taking that burr, just gently going around it, not so much prepping it, but just going around and just smoothing off my gingival margins. Doesn't take long. Um, it's just something that's quick and easy. You just wanna make sure that everything is nice and smooth for the impression to be had. And then we're gonna redefine our prep. We've done our gross reduction with coarse diamond burrs. You wanna go back over those axial walls. You don't want your axial walls to look like that. You want them to be nice and smooth. So for this, I'm gonna use a round and a tapered fine burr to do my axial walls. And then that inclusal one third in the occlusal table, I'm gonna use this gold, gold egg shaped finishing bird to kind of smooth out this area on the occlusal and the occlusal one third of my prep. Uh, again, the, the smoother your surfaces are, the easier it is to take a good impression. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is use this in cutting bird to kind of smooth out my, my margin surfaces. So any questions, bringing them down, going on. I answer some of these questions. Some of the questions are, um, how do you use the flame to define the gingival margins? I've to discuss that. Um, look, one of the questions is, where do you get the in cutting burrs? Those burrs can be, usually most burr companies have some type of in cutting burrs. Um, again, if you email me this question, I can give more specific in terms of where I get them um, and where you can find the in-cutting burrs. Another question is about hand pieces. Um, what's my opinion on either air-driven turbine or electric hand pieces? Um, definitely the electric hand pieces give you an advantage when you're prepping. Um, it's a different world when you're using um, an electric hand piece. Um, there's some good hand-driven hand pieces out there too, but um, what the electric hand pieces just give you a lot of speed and a lot of efficiency that you will lack in an air-driven hand piece. Um, 
again, I'm just kind of going through a couple of these questions. One of the questions is, um, aren't you afraid of gouging the side of the tooth when you're redefining your preps with this flame burn? Again, you wanna take your time. You're not really prepping the margins. You're just kind of dragging the burr around it so that um, you have a nice even um, surface that goes up against the surface of your margins. Okay. Okay, that's, what the, that's all with the questions for now. The next thing we wanna to move to is soft tissue management or retraction. I wanna make sure that um, when I'm doing my, when I'm taking an impression, I don't wanna take an impression of just my margin. I wanna take an impression of the margin and over the edge to make sure I capture as much detail because the more I give the lab, the better the crown and bridge is gonna be. And so you wanna make sure that um, your margins are clean and that you do do soft tissue retraction. One of the things that the lab have noticed that a lot of doctors are sending cases that they're not even doing any type of soft tissue management or retraction. And with those cases, you run the risk of, again, not seeing the margins, not having good margins. Um, so it's always best, no matter what, to do some type of soft tissue retraction. Um, I know a lot of times I'll go into prep thinking that, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep these margins super gingival to the big root canal, um, but it always turns out at some point, there's portions of this margin that is gonna be either at or slightly below the gum line. In those situations, you must do some type of retraction. So um, with that, I'm gonna go over some of the options in terms of retraction. Um, traditionally, um, retraction cords are, have been around for a long time. Um, the only problem with them is that they take a lot of time to do. Um, they can be a little bit traumatic to the soft tissue, but they work every time. Um, they're time consuming, but they work. Another option would be retraction caps and pace. Uh, this, is a, this is a quicker procedure. Um, you're just using paste that's expressed over your preps and a cap to kind of push down that paste and display the soft tissue. So it's a lot less traumatic to the soft tissue. Um, but the drawback is, is it works most of the time. It doesn't work every time like cords do, but it works most of the time. So for the most part, this is the, the, the technique I use in terms of retraction, retraction caps and retraction paste. And then the third way is using a prep impression and retraction paste. I use this technique when I'm have prepped multiple teeth and I don't want to pack cord. And we'll go into this technique in a moment. The first one using retraction cord, you usually do a two cord technique where you're using a thin either double zero first it's placed around the tooth. And then on top of that, you're either using a zero or a size one thicker cord to go around the tooth. Leave that there for a couple of minutes. Remove the top cord, leave the bottom cord in and take an impression. Very simple, straightforward. Again, when you're doing multiple teeth, it can't be time consuming. When I do pack cord, the cords that I like to use, the Nip Pack by Premier or the Nip Pack Plus, that has hemostatic um, agents embedded in them. Um, these cords work very well, they're durable. Um, they come in different sizes, different thickness. So uh, when I'm using this technique, um, they come in very, they come, they are very handy. The other technique using retraction caps and paste, um, less traumatic, um, again, I like, this premier product, Traxident, and the retraction caps. This Traxident um, comes in a syringe, easily um, extrudes the material around your prep, and then you're placing the cap right on top, letting the patient bite down for a couple of minutes, and 
washing it off and you're good to go with your impression. This is tooth number 14 where we use Retraxodin um, paste and retraction cap spot premier. Um, up, upper right, I've placed a paste around my prep. I usually do at least two to three layers of this paste on my prep, then place the cap on top of it, have the patient bite down. Here it's a little bit, it's so easy for the patient just to bite down. At this point, two minutes, I'm gonna do a hygiene check, make sure um, if I have another patient, check on them as this retraction kind of technique kind of takes hold, um, come back, take off the cap, rinse off the tooth, and it does a really good job of reflecting all the soft tissue off your margins. Again, nice thick margins so you can see everything. I mean, I'm gonna keep coming back to that because again, so many times labs have told me that, you know what, if doctors would just, just do some basic soft tissue retraction, that would help their crown and bridge cases tremendously. And then this is the final impression of that tooth. Again, I'm getting more than just going to the edge. I'm getting over the edge impressions, nice, clean. And as you can see, this is the opposing tooth number, number 19 and 30, I mean, 19 and 18 with the soft, with the light body material in my impression. Hold on, good. And then the last technique where I'm using um, an impression and retraction paste with multiple prep teeth. In this case, uh, tooth number three and tooth number five have been prepped. Um, using these caps in the retraction paste not always a good idea. Sometimes it's, it's kind of hard to kind of get the caps to be evenly placed so you have even pressure on them. So for this, I'm going to take a triple tray, use bite registration material, take a quick impression of my prepped teeth, as you see here, and then apply the retraction paste around my preps and then insert that same impression over my preps, pushing the retraction paste up into the sulcus, displacing the soft tissue, having the patient bite down for two or three minutes, taking the impression tray out, washing the preps off, and then ready to take an impression. Here we have two, three unit bridges, um, seven, six and nine, and six and eight and nine and 11. I've been taking the impression of my preps, place the retraction paste around each retainer, place the, re the impression tray back over those preps, have the patient bite down for a couple of minutes, and then wash all the uh, retraction paste off and ready to take impression. Uh, this is a little bit quicker and easier than packing cord, which could work in this situation, but that's a lot of cord to pack. I'm packing two cords, per tooth, that's eight cords, as opposed to just expressing some pace around each tooth and placing the impression over top of them. Again, doesn't take that long, but this is a demonstration of that technique. Three unit bridge, six to eight, placing the retraction pace around each tooth, each prep, and then having the patient bite down on the impression that I've made. Again, patients biting down on this for two or three minutes, a lot less traumatic to the soft tissue and a lot quicker than packing cord. Any questions? One of the questions um, is about putting the, the light body material on the opposing. Um, the question is, was there impression material on the opposing arch? Yes, you're just taking, um, they're asking a question about using the light body on the opposing arch. You do it the same way you normally do in terms of taking the final impression. In this case, we're using a uh, tray material and a triple tray. Um, it's just that once you've expressed the light body around your prep, 
the last thing you want to do is just put a little bit on the opposing arch plusal surfaces and then have the patient bite down into your tray. Okay, impressions. So, digital impressions are becoming more popular. A lot of people are using them, so we have to talk about them. Um, studies have shown that these types of impressions do a really good job of allowing us to see our preps in real time under magnification, which we don't get that with traditional impressions. Um, with these types of impressions, as you can see the upper right, you can just see everything about your prep from the facial, from the lingual in this position, in this um, photo. Um, they're just give us uh, a perspective of our preps that we just don't see until the case comes back to the lab, poured up and in the stone form. Also, these types of impressions take less time. Um, even in the very beginning, there is um, a slight learning curve, but even during that period of time, um, taking these types of impression doesn't take a lot of time. Um, you're not waiting for material to set up. You're just basically moving a wand of, of your scanner over the occlusal surface, lingual buckle, and then you're done. And the third thing is that it's definitely a lot more comfortable um, with this type of impression technique as opposed to um, traditional impression trays and materials. Um, patients typically don't mind having this small scanner in their mouth, as you can see in the lower right here. And again, because it's, it's smaller and you're not in there as long, it just makes for a better experience for the patient as far as taking an impression. Now, there are limitations to digital impressions. Um, one of the things is that with these digital impressions, you must, you have to soft tissue retract. It, it's just not an option. Um, and sometimes that can be difficult, but especially when you're dealing with subgenital margins or margins that just aren't regular, um, the scanner takes could be a difficult choice to use in those situations. So anytime, you know, before I decide that I'm going to prep and trying to make a decision whether I'm going to do traditional or am I going to do a scan, I have to take that in consideration. Okay, where, am, where are my margins going to fall? Are they Are going to be more sub G or they're going to be more above the gum line? If they're more above, then I'm more apt to use a digital impression. If they're more sub G, I'm more inclined to, to use traditional methods of taking an impression. The other thing is these scans, just, they just simply can't be used for every impression that you're gonna take. So if you think that, okay, I'm gonna to go to digital scanning and I'm gonna get rid of my traditional material of taking impressions, it, it's not gonna work that way. Um, no matter what you do, there are gonna be situations where you just can't get a scan for an impression. So um, you're still gonna to have to do some type of traditional impressions sometime in your office, even though you have a scanner. Um, and then the last thing is the cost. The cost is still kind of high. Even though these scanners have been out for a long period of time, it still costs. The range is anywhere between 30 and 50,000. That's, that's a big chunk of money to spend on a scanner. Um, even when you're not just, you know, full throttle and just scanning everything, it's still a lot of money to come up with. So um, hopefully as people use them more, um, that cost will come down. My experience with digital scanners, about seven years ago, um, I bought a scanner. I was in the 3M COS um, system that had powder. It was a powdered scanner that used, that used powder to pick up the, the images. Um, it was okay. Um, I thought at the time it was still a little bit faster than traditional impressions, um, but Somehow we kind of moved away from that, went back to traditional impression taking. And then about maybe a year ago, I got another system. Um, and nowadays, most of the, the scanning is done without powder. So 
these systems now are definitely faster. Um, they allow you to um, just pick up the impressions a lot quicker than traditional impressions. Um, the one thing that I do like about digital scanning is that one is the time and two is that the accuracy and the detail that you get with their impressions is just far better than traditional impressions. Um, and as far as the lab is concerned, they definitely have experienced less remakes with tradition with um, scanning scanned impressions. Um, it's just that's just because that's how accurate these particular scanned impressions can be, um, and they're getting better. You know, as time goes on, improvements are going to be made, and as they are, and hopefully, again, more people are able to get the scanners, um, and hopefully, the prices will come down on them. Um, one of the things that I really like about doing digital scanning is that you get real-time information about your preps. You don't have to wait till they get to the lab and they pull up the models like, oh, you have from undercut or, oh, there's not enough reduction. You get that information right away. Um, in this case, this is the scale in terms of how much reduction you've had in between your teeth. The red is kind of no reduction or zero. Um, and then up here in the green is two millimeters of reduction. So as you can see, I did this, this is the same case, tooth number 19 that we did a couple of days ago. Um, on my initial prep, we took the impressions, both top and bottom. Um, when we did the occlusal analysis, it came back that I had some green, which is almost two millimeters, probably a little bit less than two millimeters. Um, so what did I do? just kind of cut out this portion of, on my scan and then rescanned it or, or did the reduction a little bit more, and then rescanned. And then as you can see on the rescan, I have no color. So that means I'm more than two millimeters of clearance um, with this prep. So again, the, the main thing with the digital scanners is you got real time information about your preps. And you're just able to see a lot more because of the magnification that you're getting. You can see all the undercuts. You can see if your margins are nice and smooth or, or if they're not smooth. You can see if your actual walls are smooth. So those are the things that I like about the digital scans. Now, things that we can do to improve our traditional impression taking, um, again, you must retract. That's just a given that you have to do some type of soft tissue retraction, whether it's digital scan or not. Also, before taking the impressions, we wanna make sure that we try in our trays before we add the material to them. I mean, that happens all the time. We're in a rush, we just pick out a tray, um, we think it's gonna work, assistant loads up the tray, and then we go to place it in and it's not fitting, whether it's short or it's, it's hitting opposing teeth the wrong way. You wanna make sure that you check the fit of your trays before you add the material to them. Check the size, make sure the patient isn't gagging on, on these trays. Um, also, it gives you an opportunity to practice placing these trays in. Sometimes it's not easy trying to place these trays without hitting the material the uh, tray material against the teeth that you want to take the impression of. So you want, that gives you an opportunity to practice, but also it gives the patient an opportunity to practice biting down into these trays. And sometimes it's just not that easy. So you want to take the time to check the fit of your trays. Also, you want to make sure that you're using light body and heavy body materials from the same company. Um, there's no reason um, not to do this. Most companies, if they have any type of impression materials, have both a light body and at least a heavy body or tray material so that they can be more compatible um, together. Because when companies do their researches, they're basing that off of the same materials that they're producing. That in this, in this way, you get the best of the material. When you mix and match different companies, light body, heavy body, you never know what type of setting times you're going to get. You never know what the strength of that impression material is going to be once it's set 
Um, you don't know the stability of the, the impression. So it's always best to use the same um, light and heavy body from the same company. I'm gonna break for a second. There's a couple of questions here. Going back to the retraction pace, the question is um, how to use the retraction pace in caps. Basically, we're using the pace, putting it around the prep teeth, placing the cap in over that prep, over the pace, having the patient bite down for two to three minutes. Once they do that, take the cap off, we're washing the prep really clean, making sure that all the debris from the pace is off your prep, off the margins, and then taking an impression. So the other question is about the using the prep impression and the retraction pace as a retraction method. And so again, what we're doing is we prep the tooth. Once the teeth have been prepped, we've done our refinement, everything's ready to go. We'll take a quick impression with bite registration, which takes anywhere between eight to 10 seconds, take a quick impression of our preps with a triple tray. Once we do that, we'll put in a retraction paste around each prep and then placing that root, that same tray back into the patient's mouth to have them bite down for two to three minutes. Once they do that, take out the tray, rinse off the retraction paste, make sure everything is nice and clean on the preps, and then take your final impression, whether it be traditional with another, with another tray, with light body and heavy body, or you're ready for your digital scan. The other question was, what, uh, retraction paste that I use um, when I use the method of the impression and retraction paste. Um, the, the answer is yes, I've used Traxident, but you can use any of the retraction pastes. It, it works. The main thing is that you're getting a good impression of your preps that's going to push that paste into the sock eye around your, around your margins and displace the soft tissue. Last question dealing with that technique. Um, do I put impression material on both sides? Um, you can. Uh, when I'm taking an impression of the preps, I'll put enough. Remember, it's a bite registration, so you got to kind of move really quickly. If you're going to put some on the opposing, that's cool. That's fine. But then you got to make sure that you put it in the spot where you really, really need it, which is where the preps are. Back to um, traditional impressions. So in preparing to take an um, traditional impression, when I'm, we want to select the proper tray, select the materials, the trays, typically single unit crown, triple tray is fine. Um, you want to make sure that you're consistent in terms of the types of trays that you're using. Um, you want to you want to use a, a nice, strong, firm, rigid tray. Um, that's going to capture not only the tooth that you're prepping, but at least one or two teeth posterior and anterior of that prep tooth. Um, you have a lot of options here to the left. Um, these are ripper triple trays. Um, they're very sturdy. Um, this posterior one has a metal reinforcement in it. Um, I use this a lot, especially with the posterior teeth. Um, or you can use, use traditional um, arch trays, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the only thing is, is you're using more material, takes a little bit longer as opposed to a quadrant or um, a quadrant triple tray. Also, triple trays come in different sizes. There are longer ones to capture more of a um, whole quadrant. And then there's also full mouth triple trays. Um, I tend not to use those that much, but there are situations where we, we can use them. Um, message from the lab, uh, they want, when we're whatever we're using, the trays that they would prefer us to use are gonna be rigid, wide, and flat. Again, this is similar to the one that I typically would use with all my posterior teeth, a rigid metal reinforced impression tray that's fairly wide and nice and flat. As far as Impression materials are concerned. You always want to make make sure that you're using a material that you're comfortable with that works best in your hands. Um, usually, these 
these types of impression materials, traditional impression materials, are polysiloxanes or silicon-based impression materials. Um, they're usually hydroph hydrophilic, meaning they tolerate moisture, and they come in some type of cartridge auto-mixing um, tip setup. Uh, the traditional impression material that I use the most is uh, Panacea by Kenbach. Um, what I like about this material is that it's consistent. Um, I consistently don't get all, don't get any bubbles in my light body material. Um, it's consistent. It's consistent in terms of how it captures my the margins of the preps that I've that I've created. Um, it's just um, a good product, and that's what we kind of really strive for. We want to make we want a consistent product that's going to do the same thing every single time, and and their products seem to do that. Tend to do that. Um, another thing that you need to, to be aware of when you're using these cartridge auto mixing tips, you wanna make sure that you bleed out the material, especially when you're opening up a new cartridge. So this isn't a demonstration of how to kind of bleed out a new cartridge. You're taking off this tip. Um, instead of just sticking on your auto mixing tip, you wanna bleed out that top material, making sure that the materials are coming out evenly and that they're not runny. Um, once you verify that, as you can see here, I got nice material and a, an even flow coming out. At that point, I'm gonna put in my auto mixing tip and use the cartridge for whatever we're gonna use, for, whether it be a light body or the heavy body to fill up a tray. Um, once we're done expressing the material, I typically, we typically would leave the cap or the tip on, all the material in here gets hard. And then now this acts as our cap for the impression material. And it stays on there until the next time. And then we repeat the same thing. Again, taking this used cap off, expressing some of the material, bleeding it out a little bit, and then um, using that cartridge again. Um, one of the things that um, the lab has brought to my attention is that a lot of times doctors try to be kind of stingy with the impression material. Um, and when they do that, they're only filling up kind of the middle portion of your impression tray. And that's not always a good thing, especially when you're using triple trays and the lab is trying to pour up not just the one side, but they're trying to pour up two sides. So when you're using a triple tray, the tray material should cover the entire mesh area and a little bit into the interlocking areas of your tray so that when you seat this tray, some of that material displaces into those areas to interlock and to stay um, engaged into your tray. It, it doesn't serve well when you don't utilize the full function of your impression trays. Also, in doing this, you want a nice even spread and you don't want it built up too high. As you can see in this lower right photo, um, the impression tray is filled up, but it's not overly filled up. This will allow you to easily place the, the impression tray inside the mouth without kind of touching the teeth and causing any kind of um, depressions or voids before you seat the impression tray with the material. Making the impression, uh, typically with traditional impression materials, we wanna do a one-step impression technique or using heavy body in the tray or tray material inside the impression tray and then the light body against the, the prep teeth. We wanna make sure when we're applying that light body, to our prep teeth, we want to make sure the tip is always in the material. And then as you're expressing that light body around your prep, you want to go very, very slow. At this point, we're kind of rushing through things. We're trying to get through and be efficient in our prep cutting, making sure the margins are there, making sure everything is visible, doing a good job with the soft tissue retraction. Again, that takes a little bit of time. 
um, the two to three minutes to kind of displace the soft tissue. But at this point, once we have cleaned off all of our preps and we're ready to take this impression and apply the light body, you want to make sure you do that nice and slow. A lot of times, if you don't and you are in a rush, sometimes, depending on the angulation of your tip, you kind of displace that soft, that light body material and you don't get a good impression. So again, make sure that you go slow when you're expressing the light body material around your preps. Also, you want to make sure the light body material is on the adjacent teeth, on the occlusal surface, and also in the, in the contact areas. And then as we mentioned before, trying to get some of that light body material on the occlusal surface of the opposing teeth. Okay, so what to look for um, once you have made these impressions. Um, I know a lot of times it's hard because in dental school, we're not taught to, to kind of really look at impressions in terms of, okay, it's trying to figure out what's wrong. Um, but you have to, once you've taken a traditional impression, um, take the time to kind of look and see that you've captured everything that you've wanted to capture. The first thing I look at is my margins. Are my margins complete and intact without any breaks or voids? That's the first thing. Because if there are, then you wanna take a new impression. Also, you wanna make sure that there's no tray interference because if there's tray interference, meaning that parts of the tray are hitting either the teeth or hitting soft tissue or bone, that can potentially distort your impression. So you wanna make sure that there's no tray show through um, in your impressions. Also, you wanna make sure in the contact areas, because this is kind of vital when you're making a crown in between two teeth, you wanna make sure that those areas are captured completely without any voids or pools. And if they are, it's a good thing to kind of take that impression over again. And again, that's one of the, the advantages of, of scanning is that if you have a bad impression, um, you know right away and you can make those adjustments right away in terms of whether it be an adjustment in the prep that you have to do or an adjustment in terms of capturing the, the impression the way you wanna capture it. Or if there's a soft tissue issue in terms of, okay, there's not enough margin that's being exposed. I need to take a new impression. It's quick, it's easy. Um, you're not using a lot of material, so it doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, again, that's the big advantages of, of the digital scan impressions is that you get real time information about your pest before it even goes out the door. And then the last thing you wanna do is you wanna verify the occlusal clearance of your impression. Now, how you can do this is once you've made this impression, this is tooth number 29, you hold this impression up to your light, whether it be your operatory light or the room light. And if you don't have light showing through it, this is tooth number 29, then chances are you have at least two millimeters of material um, for the clearance um, of, uh, for your case. Um, as you can see in these areas where there's contact, the patient has bitten down into this triple tray, it's very, very light, very, very little material there. But in the area that where we've prepped tooth number 29, it's very, very dark. So that's one of the ways why, how you can check to see if you have enough clearance in regards to traditional impression taking. So, one of the things, the other thing that I, I just want to stress about Crowner Bridge is that you need the lab to understand that some of the times the preps that you send are the best that you can do for those situations. But as we do that, you also have to understand from the lab's point of view what they're going through and what they're dealing with. And if we can do the things that we know and that we've been taught to do, which is soft tissue retract for each case, making sure that we're seeing the margins, um, and then also relaying any pertinent information about the case to the lab, whether it be, okay, I know we're gonna be tight on the occlusal 
um, spacing. So give me a reduction coping or whatever the case is gonna be, just make sure that you're communicating to your lab so that um, it, makes that it makes that communication or that relationship a lot better. Because when you have a good communication with your lab and a good relationship with your lab, your, out your chronic bridge outcomes tend to be very, very good. As I said before, if you have any additional questions, uh, just email me. I can send you the whole presentation in the PDF form. Um, I'll answer the questions for you. And that's it. I hope you guys got a lot out of this. I hope it will help you um, the next time you're doing a Crown and Bridge case. And thank you. So one of the questions they're asking for single teeth, do you take separate impression trays for both arches and then a, another bite registration. I'm not sure about that, but I'm trying to answer as best I can. Um, typically, in terms of taking a traditional impression with traditional impression material, you can either use a triple tray where you're filling both sides of that triple tray with heavy body tray material, and then you're expressing light body around your prep. Then you're having the patient bite down, which is capturing both arches at the same time. Once that's done, then you can have the patient sit up and take a separate bite registration. Now, if you're not gonna use a triple tray, then using a traditional full arch tray is also possible where you're using separate trays for each arch. So an upper arch, you're taking an impression, a lower arch, you're taking an impression. After that, again, setting the patient up and doing a bite registration of the entire arch. That was one question. Um, another question is, do you have any insight regarding placing light body material to avoid, into voids? So I think the question is asking me, what do you do when you have an impression and it has some voids? Well, depending on how big the void is, will determine what I'm gonna do. If it's a very small void, and it's not on my margin, maybe it's on the axial wall, or maybe it's on the occlusal surface, I'm more apt to um, add a little bit of light body material and place that, that impression tray back into the mouth and have the patient bite down to capture that small void. If it's a big void, um, outside of taking an impression over again, which is always the best, what I will do is maybe I will cut out that portion of the impression with a burr um, and also in cutting it out, creating some relief channels so that I can fill that portion of the impression back up with new impression material, light body impression material, and then reinsert that impression tray back in over, over the preps and, and let that set up. So those are the kinds of, um, options you have outside of taking the impression over again. And again, with the digital impression, it's so much easier in terms of taking an impression over again, because you're not, you're not having to kind of take the entire arch over again. All you have to do is just kind of capture that, that prep as opposed to the whole arch. And you're still getting a nice, good, clean um, impression of the entire arch. Um, another question is, uh, explain a little bit more about the reduction coping. Reduction coping is something that the lab can fabricate out of um, resin or Duralay um, material. Uh, once you send your cases into the lab and they pull up the model and they find out that there's not enough space, what they do is they reduce your prep, at least the occlusal surfaces, to the amount of space that they need to fabricate the, the final restoration. And then they put um, a resin kind of material over top of it. And what this does is it allows you to be able to cut back your prep once you receive the permanent crown um, using this reduction coping so that the permanent crown can fit. Otherwise, if you don't cut it back, the crown is made to the reduction in the reduction coping, it's not gonna fit. 
Um, looking for other questions. Um, one of the another question is: Do I use chlorhexidine rinses? Um, I don't use the chlorhexidine rinses. Um, I I just don't. I typically use, like I described before earlier, I use the hemocil, and what that does because it has chlorhexidine in it. I'm more specific in terms of using it on the tooth that I'm prepping or on the teeth that I'm prepping to ensure that I have a nice clean surface that's desensitized and um, is ready to receive whether it be a permanent restoration or a temporary crown. Um, another question is, um, do you find it difficult to wash out the traxident completely off the preps? Um, with any of the retraction paces, it can be difficult. I haven't come up with a way to kind of get around that. Um, some are a little bit um, easier to rinse off than others, but for the most part, they're, they're, they're kind of about the same. Um, I think that the longer you have the patient bite down on, whether it be a, um, an impression or a retraction cap, the better chance that you have less displacement when you're rinsing this, these materials off. So you wanna make sure that you have the patient bite down a good, three minutes, two to three minutes, um, so that that soft tissue is displaced well enough to you, for you to, to allow you to kind of rinse off that prep thoroughly. And then sometimes what I'll do is once I do rinse it off, I'll take a clean micro brush and wipe that around the prep to ensure that I make sure that I've gotten all the retraction paste off my prep. Uh, I think that's it. A couple of people are asking about um, using air to build a light body in, into the salt guy. Um, I typically don't do that. I haven't used that technique. Um, I feel that if you take your time and slowly express the light body around your preps, because you've done a, such a good job of the soft tissue management and being able to prep in a way that's going to be more receptive to your impression material, um, if you take your time, it, it kind of works out pretty good as opposed to blowing air onto that onto your light body materials. That's it. And again, any other questions, just shoot me an email and I'll try to I'll make sure that I answer all the questions that are sent to me.